From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 161, recorded on November 8th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. And from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> a lovely day. Bright sunshine here. Yep. yep. Don't get too used to it. It's uh, The sun is low on the horizon because we are now in daylight savings. Time. I know. It's right. a little depressing now. You know? Why do we have to do that? I don't know. All right. Do you know, Daniel, why we have to change time once a year, twice a year? I, I, I can't say I agree with it, but there there's all kinds of theories about sunlight and things like that. Oh. But, you know, as a couple of things people may have noticed, for instance, Arizona has given up on the whole switching off of the better time zone setup. And uh, we have shortened a little bit. We have a little less time off of daylight savings because I think we all enjoy daylight savings. You save it and then you spend it. You save it and you just like money, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, gives like you, money. it actually gives you something to look forward to every year. Speaking of look forward to, I bet our listeners have been looking forward to this TWIP because it's been a month. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's been a while. Let's see when the last TWIP was issued. Would you know offhand, Dixon? Nine, let's see. Um, I month? say that jokingly. It was about two and a half weeks it was ago. October 10th. Two and a half. Which was a month ago. A month. Wow. Okay. In the meantime, we've had an election. Yes. And all sorts of crises. Well, we've had those all. We've had a shooting in California today, <laughs> Ooh, which terrible, is bad, terrible stuff. and lots of parasitic infections. Yeah. Speaking of which, we have a case from the last TWIP. We do. Daniel, remind us of that. Oh, certainly. For those of you clicking in, tuning in for the first time, and those of you tuning back in who have forgotten because it has been so long... Uh, we had a case which was a consult that I was asked to see, a 40-year-old immigrant originally from Brazil who had worked um, – uh, let's see what it says – had worked there, uh, has some family here in the United States. And while here, uh, he had seen a physician for increased heart rate. Uh, there was a noticed arrhythmia. There was premature ventricular contractions, uh, some – some arrhythmias, which I described as atrial fibrillation and flutter. He'd been treated by a cardiologist, and then he ended up getting an implantable defibrillator. Uh, there were some diagnostics that uh, we shared. Uh, the EKG had shown a right bundle branch block. He had an echocardiogram that showed that his heart was dilated with an apical aneurysm, and there was actually um, thrombosis that was seen on the echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a whole bunch. Of we do. Guess is because it's been a month. Indeed. First one is from Anna, who writes, Hello, Twipsters. First, thank you for your excellent work on this podcast. I am a virologist in training, currently a graduate student in the laboratory of Dave O'Connor at UW-Madison, but I love all things related to the study of infectious diseases and have really enjoyed getting regular exposure through you all to the world of parasitology. So thank you very much. And I will be out in UW Madison in uh, December doing a podcast. Excellent. With a virus legend, Roland Rookert. All right. It will be on the top floor of Bach Laboratories, open to the public. Check it out, Anna. It's a great campus. There has been one consistent issue with the show, though, that has really been quite disheartening. All the heroes of parasitology are men. And additionally, I'm pretty sure they're all white men. I really cannot emphasize. Enough how discouraging it is as a female trainee in science to consistently hear only males praised as heroes of an entire field, with, of course, the wonderful exception of Miriam Rothschild, sent in by a listener a while ago. It's really hard to believe you belong in a field if you're never presented with a role model who is anything like you. And the same is true for people of color in STEM. I also found it hard to believe there could be no great women in the whole history of parasitology, though. So I went searching for some, and I found them. And she lists Dr. Eloise Cram, first woman president of the ASP, leader in the study of schistosomiasis, and Bishop, best known for a comprehensive study of plasmodium, never officially awarded a doctorate despite having completed one because Cambridge did not award doctorates to women 
At the time she completed hers, also discovered several new parasitic species, one of the first female fellows of the Royal Society and founded the British Society for Parasitology, and Susan Lim, a Malaysian parasitologist who specialized in the study of the class of parasitic flatworms, the monogenia. Right. Four species of monogenians and one monogenian genus have been named for Dr. Lim in honor of her pioneering work on these organisms. Right here. Quite a few other brilliant and influential female parasitologists I've found over the day past day of searching. And she has sent us a biography and she can write others if we'd like. What say ye, gentlemen? We say great. Absolutely wonderful. No, my my comment. Thank you so much. <clears throat> indeed, and, uh, indeed, you know, and we always say that what we do um, as far as our book, as far as our presentation, we're always asking. We're always hoping people will uh, help us out. And what we were discussing a little bit, sort of before the recording started, was that in a lot of fields of science, women have actually really done a lot of great things. People of color, non-white men, we'll just be broad here, um, have done a lot of great things, and it is an incredible challenge for them to get recognized in the climate. So a lot of times you you hear of these people, and you're like, I've never heard of this person. And that isn't because they um, fail to do something really significant. It may be because they fail to get the recognition that they deserved. So this is excellent. And I think, um, thank you for helping us. Uh, let's all be part of this effort to change that. Right. So you'll, in the future, do some of these sure. female parasites no, no sent in by it. Anne. No, and Anne doesn't have to be the only one to send them in either. All right. So we will accept any uh, legitimate hero-like person of any gender, any color, <laughs> frankly. And uh, please don't get the idea that we agree with the fact that there are only um, old white men as heroes. This is how we grew up learning the subject. So um, it's it's a matter of a sin of omission rather than a uh, sin of um, purposeful omission. And so uh, – yeah, we, we'd like to correct this problem as well. Right. So in future episodes, you will do some of these. That's here, here. Okay. And potentially put them in the book. You know, we're coming out yep. with a no, no. seventh edition. We're getting pretty close. And this is very timely. So we'll make a point of looking a little closer at uh, Eloise Cram, right. Ann Bishop, right. Susan Lim. and yep. you got to put M- Miriam Rothschild She's in She's definitely book. going in. Miriam and, Rothschild is already there. We've got her biography. Don't put me in because I'm an old white man. <laughs> And I'm not a parasitologist. <laughs> okay, fine. All right, I figure I'd take a shot at the case. The young man with fever pain in the right upper quad and a single fluid-filled lesion in the liver is most likely suffering extra-intestinal amoebiasis due to infection with entamoeba histolytica. Severe upper right quadrant pain on enlarged liver fluid-filled cavity indicate an amoebic liver abscess, and the aspirated fluid would likely be of the brown anchovy paste variety. Pleural effusion is likely due to perforation by the abscess of the diaphragm. The intercostal tenderness is characteristic of extra-intestinal amoebiasis. Severe infections can result in eosinopenia, as seen in this patient. Elevated white count with a left shift, the fever, general body aches, also signs of a severe systemic infection. The elevated alkphos is a sign of limer damage from the abscess diagnosis by serological testing and imaging, like the ultrasound visualization in this case. And the appearance of the aspirated fluid would help confirm diagnosis. Metronidazole is the drug of choice for both intestinal and extra-intestinal e-histolytic disease. And alternative medications include nitroxinide and or, or nidazole. The patient likely acquired this from a less-than-clean water supply. The differential for this man includes a high-dated cyst in the liver due to echinococcus granulosis, which would also result in a fluid-filled hepatic lesion in liver enlargement, though the rest of his symptoms fit better with e-histolytica. An enlarged liver and a pleural effusion could also indicate metastatic cancer, though a fluid-filled liver cavity, which can be aspirated, makes this less likely. A cystic lesion in the liver could also be a hemangioma or a hamartoma, but neither of these fit with the rest of the clinical picture. Credit for the above information goes to my med school classes taught by the wonderful Dr. Laura Knoll to Sketchy Microbe, an online memory aid device used by medical students <laughs> to learn their microbes and parasitic diseases, 6th edition. My diagnosis is wrong. Credit for that can only be given to me. Weather in Madison, surprising, 73F with intermittent showers and sunshine. Thanks again for the wonderful podcast.
Thank you, Anna. I was I was going to jump in, um, yes, because I believe, unless I'm mistaken, that this was a response to the case of the male in his twenties admitted to the hospital during the rainy season in southern India. So, um, so I think, yes. yeah, the man who was drinking a lot of date palm yes. wine and he had a fluid filled hepatic lesion and, no, and right, she right. was correct. Yes, it was. He, e histolytica. So Indeed. better to be late than never and correct at that. That's right. Well, so I, I think we've got several of them that referred back to that case. Sorry, we, no, that's okay. Should I just remind everyone so they can they can have two? <laughs> so we <laughs> we we have the. I guess it's been a month. So we had the one case with the gentleman. Um, we'll just say from South America with cardiac issues, but we had also previous to that, and I think maybe those were close enough. We had also had a young male in his twenties in southern India who drank a lot of date palm liquor, who was admitted with a liver lesion. So I guess we'll sort of as we go. Um, I think the next one is also going to be talking about date <laughs> liquor and the liver it lesion. Is. So we'll, you know, maybe we have to give out two books. I'm not sure. Uh, we can do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Eric, Eric writes, hi, TWIP team. I've been a lurker for over a year now, enjoying listening to cases, but never had the time to write in until now. Here are my thoughts for the case of the gentleman in his twenties in India. At first, when you mentioned the date palm liquor, my mind went immediately to Nipah. Then remember, this is TWIV, not TWIV. Hmm. But as reminded of the new cases in India from the recent TWIV 504, and oh, also, the clinical signs don't fit at all. Damn. Type 1 reasoning. Once I got over that red herring thought, <clears throat> my top uh, diagnosis was entamoeba histolytica, creating a liver abscess, based on PD-6 edition. There are a few pieces of evidence that fit with our patient. One, most common extraintestinal site is the liver, creating solitary fluid-filled abscess. Then the lungs, the two locations affected in our patient. Nearly half of patients with amoebic abscess, a liver abscess, have no history of amoebic colitis, nor did I pay our patient. And a few patients have peripheral eosinophilia and may even become eosinopenic. I suspect related to the inflammation from the abscess, which would be consistent with our patient's elevated white count and shift to the left, plus the intercostal sign of tenderness on palpation between the ribs. Thanks for a great show. Daniel. All right. Peter. Peter writes to us, Ah, Karja. And uh, he, he tells us that he's been traveling for a time since he emailed a case study as the TCD parasitology group has been traveling, writing up, setting up new experiments, etc. Although it was still not possible for us to meet up for this week's case study, I did brave it alone. I did want to thank Vincent for tweeting when the podcast was recorded. It was very useful at the time. And uh, yeah. let's see, he, he is uh, he's referring to... I believe the patient has a hydatid cyst caused by the parasite Echinococcus granulosus. So he's, I think, responding to the 20-year-old man with the liver lesion. Uh, right. So he says, the aspiration of the cyst made me consider that perhaps the cyst was not of parasitic origin. As described in PD 6th edition, ruptured cyst contents concede the area and invade new tissues to produce second-generation hydatid cysts. However, later in the section, it states that puncture, aspiration, injection, Reaspiration or pair can work well with adjuvant anti helminthic chemotherapy started one month prior to performing this procedure. The hydatid liver cysts I'm more familiar with are hydatigera tianiformis cysts on wood mice livers, as I've only seen it on dead mice pair is not used <laughs> but i no. uh, i do find opening the deceptively small cyst and slowly drawing the long larvae from it a great way mm -hmm. to engage gross out the public and outreach activities <laughs> i did this recently at the probe research uncovered night at tcd along with some other members of the tcd parasitology team we wrote about it in a recent blog post that can be read here it gives us a link if interested I also wanted to write, as it was mentioned on TWIV, that Dixon is finding it hard to find female parasitology heroines. Oh, this is fantastic. Thank you, everybody. I found mm -hmm. that surprisingly, as I've always been lucky to work with um, and be mentored by inspirational female parasitologists, I would suggest Eloise Cram, oh, wow. which is the second Look at shout out here. 
I spoke to lab mate Maureen Williams about this too, and she pointed me toward a great Twitter account, Women in Parasitology. And, oh. and the sad fact that there are only eight women parasitologists, parasitologists on Wikipedia. On that oh. note, it would be great to see some female authors on the next edition of Parasitic Diseases. Yes. Uh, finally, I know you have moved on with parasitic poetry, but my favorite is a short poem by none other than William C. Campbell. Anko Circa. I don't need my goddamn eye. All I need is a bit of skin. Big enough for me to scatter a few larvae in. Just enough to make it probable that there'll be a pickup and delivery. Don't look at me that way. I don't need your goddamn eye. Slawn, <laughs> Peter Stewart at TCD Parasitology. Uh, okay. I like that poem. Did you know that existed, that gentleman? I believe we read that before. No, we read it on TWIV, actually, last week. We did. <laughs> it's a different audience, right? That's true. That's true. Sophia writes, Dear professors, I will keep this short as I think you'll get loads of answers. I think the patient is suffering from Chagas disease. Only because you spent so much time talking about this on previous episodes, I think I got it now. <laughs> Treatment, according to your book, two drugs, nifertamox and benznidazole. However, you do say that once heart begins, it might be too late. So then what? I'm assuming you did treat the patient. Mm. Diagnosis, observation of parasites, parasites through GIMSA staining and PCR. I think your book is great. Congratulations, and thank you for making it available for free. I also have a question. How does this disease affect the patient's everyday life in terms of physical activity? Uh, what if they go jogging, for example? Uh, yeah, well. I've been listening since 2011, still enjoying greetings from Greece. Cool. Dixon. I wouldn't jog if I had that. Um, you might not feel like jogging, in fact. Uh, John writes, Hello from the ever-changing weather of Flagstaff, Arizona. It definitely sounds like this poor gentleman has been infected with Trypanosoma cruzi, better known as Chagas disease. With him being from Brazil as a farmer, it would make sense that he would come in contact with the reduvid bugs that carry this disease. The, with the severity of the damage to the heart, it sounds like this infection could be the chronic form of Chagas, as the acute version typically affects younger children, and even then do not show nearly as much heart damage. Blood testing may find some trypanosome, uh, trypomasticotes, but if it is the chronic version, a follow-up using xenodiagnosis could be beneficial in identifying the specimen, if time allowed. I did also see that PCR nowadays could be a viable means to help confirm the diagnosis and would definitely bug the gentleman less. As for treatment, the drug bedzninazole has been known to have success in combating Chagas. However, I'm not entirely sure that uh, if that can help the chronic version entirely, considering it definitely is more intracellular than the acute version. Well, they're both intracellular. The, uh, the only treatment I have found through my readings is a heart transplant. But then again, my parasitology book from college is older, and Google Scholar has failed me in this area. I truly hope that he was able to have a less invasive means of treatment. And, of course, thank you for your amazing podcast. John, Parasitic Diseases 6 is available free online. Parasitic Diseases. Yes. What is the free. name? Uh ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Right. And you, there'll be links to the book. You don't have to worry about Google Scholar and exactly. your book from college, That's, right? Yeah, we don't need those stinking books. <laughs> I don't need your stinking eye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Right>. Daniel. <laughs> All right, so where where are we? Are we at Sue Ellen here? Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen. It is, Ellen. Do, Ellen. Do you guys remember she told us? Sue Ellen. Um, okay. Hello, day trippers. I am calling you <laughs> that because you keep me company today on my drive to Conyers, Georgia, from my home in Roswell. I'm here this weekend for a big horse show at the Georgia International Horse Park. Having Twip on in the car made me feel like I was on a road trip with my Three favorite docs, Vincent, Dixon, and Daniel. <laughs> and instead of playing Spot the License Plate, though, we played Spot the Parasite. Great fun traveling <laughs> with you all. Nice. By the way, I received my copy of PD6 a few weeks ago, and I'm so proud to be an owner of an autographed copy. But I still find I use the PDF more since it's more easily searchable. Okay. For this episode's case, I used my search capabilities, but... Already, though, I knew what our patient from Brazil has. I'm guessing Chagas disease caused by the protozoan Trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, 
I remember hearing on a previous twip or two that T. cruzi is a leading cause of cardiomyopathy and that it is common in Brazil and Argentina. PD-6 supported my initial diagnosis, even echoing Daniel's diagnostics with right bundle branch block being typical for the earliest disturbance evident on ECG. Now for how we would confirm the diagnosis. Well, here I have to rely on PD-6 because, of course, I'm not a physician. The book says that for chronic later stage Chagas, which this patient has, confirmation is made based on detection of serum IgG, PD-6 goes on to say, since no currently available tests for Chagas serology have the required specificity, a diagnosis is based on two positive diagnostic serology tests. It also says that the parasites can be identified microscopically. Unfortunately, once the cardiomyopathy is set in, there is not much that can be done to cure the disease. PD-6 mentions nifertamox and benzinidazole but does note that both can have very serious side effects. I would be interested to hear that this patient's, what this patient's prognosis is and whether there are any better treatments available. Mm-hmm. All right, Adil writes, Dear doctors, I know I've been writing a lot lately, but this is the one meant to be read. <laughs> first, <Okay. laughs> first, I wanted to offer one theory for how dogs are getting dracunculiasis. Gentlemen, do you remember? We do. One prevailing theory has to do with the potential of various fish species to serve as paratenic hosts for dracunculus. This is why the Carter Center's control program emphasizes techniques such as thorough cooking, burial of fish entrails, and preventing entrails entrail consumption by dogs. With regards to finding out dogs were an alternative host to humans, that was, I think, a major disappointment to everyone who rightly lauded the eradication effort's success in reducing case numbers to the extent it did and who had hoped President Carter's stated goal of outliving the worm (laughs) would have already Mm -hmm. come to pass or would do so soon. Regarding the diagnosis of the latest case, it sounds to me like Chagas. The patient is a Brazilian, and as you have noted in the past, this condition is inextricably linked with that nation to the extent It is commemorated on a stamp. Switching from my medical historian's reasoning to my more clinical one, the patient has cardiomegaly and right bundle branch block, known sequelae of Chagas. You would ask for a differential and treatment as well. Differential would include chronic hypertension, which may result in hypertrophy, rheumatic heart disease, and myocarditis. As for treatment, if it is Chagas, the Mayo Clinic treatment guidelines state that benzinidazole and nifertamox may be of benefit. After the parasite is killed, the cardiac and other symptoms can be dealt with. The former may be treated with medication, pacemaker as the patient has already received, or even a potential transplant. For the digestive symptoms, diet modification may be necessary, and medications including corticosteroids may be utilized. A severe case may require surgery. Thanks you once again for the book. In light of the win, future submissions, at least for now, will be for learning and pride (laughs) alone. (laughs) Excellent. Dixon. Carey writes, Dear TWIP advisors, <clears throat> the Brazilian gentleman has a fairly clear-cut case of Chagas disease caused by the American trypanosome T. cruzi, not to be confused with the American tetrapod Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's a tetrapod? <laughs> okay. The combination of South America, heart problems, and parasites immediately brings this parasite to mind and the specific symptoms, notably the observation of right bundle block right bundle branch block on the EKG and consistent or consistent with chronic Chagas disease. The initial acute phase may well have passed unremarked as the symptoms are often mild and nonspecific and are followed by as an asymptomatic period. The diagnosis could be confirmed by serology testing. A first positive test should be repeated due to the test's lack of specificity. Unfortunately, Treatment is much more difficult than diagnosis. While benzinidazole and nifertamox are more commonly used, they are of limited value after years of chronic disease and will not reverse the, the damage to his heart. Since these drugs have many side effects, it would be better not to prescribe them if they would not help. Rather, the immediate focus of treatment should be managing the symptoms. The heart is fairly important, so managing his condition is critical. One possibility is amidodarone, or drona drona, okay, which is an arrhythmic, uh, which are arrhythmic drugs that conveniently are also effective anti cruzi agent. Anti arrhythmic. Anti arrhythmic, isn't that what I said? You said arrhythmic. <laughs> oh, 
We try. We, yeah, be... we try to avoid giving <laughs> arrhythmia-inducing <laughs> agents. She but... says it's anti-arrhythmic. Yes. Yeah, you said arrhythmic. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right, I will repeat. You myself. need to argue with us all the time, Dixon de Pomier. Wait, be I'm nice to arguing. Dixon before someone else tells us. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to correct myself here. You're not letting me do that. No, right. you said we, we didn't say you said the right thing, but he culpa. said she said. This can be used in combination with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Clinical data from the effectiveness of amino darone. A- amiodarone. Ami- amiodarone. Good. Alone is not available yet, but it seems that it might be the best option in this case. Some Chagas patients eventually require a heart transplant. In fact, the very first heart transplant ever was because of this. That would be probably jumping the gun for now, but might lie in this patient's future. Our conclusion is that Chagas disease really sucks, and neither of us is going to South America ever. If we should win the textbook, please donate it to a worthy cause or an unworthy one, if you prefer. Uh, Caitlin would like a shot at the poetry book, though. This was another transatlantic cooperative effort between Carrie, the Newcastle upon Tyne, England, and Caitlin in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. P.S. No offense to Mr. Cruz. We just can't unsee it. And now neither can you. P.S.S. Oh, oh P.P.S. We almost forgot. Video. No, no, no. Here's how it goes. Go ahead. <laughs> Reduvido. Oh, re- oh, okay, fine. See, I'm not doing well today at all levels. I'll just no, you, go home. You, you did that as a prop <laughs> just so that everyone would be reminded that our new 7th edition will have a pronunciation guide. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, so that's exactly. Dr- for, for the drugs as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. It, you know, I, nope. I don't know if we're going to have the drugs. <laughs> I think uh, I at don't least do... for the parasites, some of the insects, uh, some of the names, uh, but hopefully it will be helpful. Mark Chrislip always wants a pronunciation gla- guide, not only for the organisms, but for drugs as well. I, I've never heard this drug pronounced before. That's the first time I saw it. So I was uh, fumbling and stumbling, as they would say. I never met a drug I hadn't heard. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Chris writes, Dear Twipsters, the symptoms described quickly bring to mind chronic Chagas disease. Circulating tripomastigotes are only seen in the acute phase, so serological testing is recommended for diagnosis of older infections. A number of other parasitic infections show heart involvement and are nicely reviewed. Um, he's going to give some references, but none fit the particular symptomatology as well as American trypanosomiasis. Transmission is, of course, through the excreta of reduvid bugs, either introduced into the bite wound or a sensitive area like the eye. I had always been told these bugs favor dwellings with cracked or wooden walls, so they're unlikely to be seen in more modern houses. The only drugs available for treatment are benzidazole and nifertamox. Side effects are common with both drugs and are more pronounced in older patients. Therefore, the decision to treat needs to be weighed against likely adverse reactions, and antiparasitic treatment may not be recommended at all. The lesson here seems to be that early recognition of infection is critical, but with so many infections being initially asymptomatic, how reliable is this? It's astounding how a bug bite can irrevocably change someone's life. Um, and the, here you get a reference. On a side note, two episodes ago, you mentioned the phone-based diagnostic tool, the Loiscope. The procedure involves taking a blood sample with a capillary slide, which sits flat beneath the phone's camera, and the device's microscope lens and is advanced by a servo taking readings from multiple fields. We've been working with a modification of this tool for the quantification of heartworm microfilaria lovingly dubbed the Deroscope, a short demo of which you can see here. We get another link. All the best, Chris, from Athens, Georgia. Emily writes, hello, TWIP team. I would like to hazard a guess for the case study presented in 160, the man from Brazil with cardiac pathology. I have been a long-term, if intermittent, TWIP listener before having to stop listening to podcasts for a while during veterinary school an internship, and an internal medicine residency. I recently started listening to TWIP again while working on DNA extractions for my PhD investigating control options for bovine leukemia virus and dairy cattle in North America. It has been a welcome distraction during pipette-intense 
but intellect optional lab work. Mm -hmm. Wow, looks like we're getting a PhD DVM. (laughs) Wow, good for you. Based on my almost total lack of human medicine experience, there you go. But with the great help of the electronic copy of PD6 and Dr. Google, my top differential would be chronic infection with T. cruzi, commonly known as American trypanosomiasis or Chagas, common in Brazil, where he likely became infected before coming to the U.S., as it is the leading worldwide cause of cardiomyopathy, an interesting counterpoint to the developing world's overabundance of lifestyle and diet-related cardiovascular disease. Mm. And as this is a parasitic diseases podcast, it would also outrank other differentials related to genetic or toxic causes of cardiomyopathy. As an internist, however, my differential would not be complete unless I listed a few zebra parasitic causes that also affect the heart, courtesy of a nice review paper I have attached, Trypanosoma bruci rodensiense and gambiense, Toxoplasma gondii, solium, and Trichinella spiralis. Side note, in veterinary medicine, we also use the phrase, if you hear hoofbeats, it's likely horses and not zebras. But in my clinical experience, zebras aren't always all that rare. They aren't unicorns, after all. <laughs> Lovely. I hope I'm on the right track with my limited knowledge of human disease. I actually faintly remember learning about Chagas in vet school in one of our public health lectures about zoonoses and One Health, but luckily lived too far north to encounter the vector. Dogs can apparently suffer from T. cruzi infections, but as I have specialized in large animal internal medicine, <laughs> horses and cows mostly, but also sheep, goats, alpacas, llamas, this disease hadn't been on my radar recently. I did include a case report below about Chagas in a horse in Texas, however, if any of the listeners are interested in a vet viewpoint on the disease. Thanks again for entertaining my guests and for producing an entertaining and educational podcast series. Although it would be great to have a hard copy of the book, if I was to win the random number draw, I would prefer the book go to someone who would get more use out of it than a vet epidemiologist slash large animal internist. Sincerely, Emily. Lovely. You know, I was going to say, though, um, it, it is amazing how much crossover there is between human and veterinary medicine. I, I recently um, had a patient who was having a, a bacterial issue. It sort of came out in our discussion that she was quite the equestrian. Um, and the bacterial issue was uh, an MRSA, um, recurrent MRSA. So I ended up reaching out to um, initially one of my old friends who's a retired um, horse surgeon. And then we got a uh, a professor from one of the California schools involved who specializes in horse bacterial infections. And uh, there was this whole interaction. Um, uh, Apparently, horse are big MRSA carriers. And there's a higher rate of MRSA in equestrians than in the common public. And so now we're we're dealing with the very interesting issue of um, how do you do MRSA eradication for this woman, like this decolonization protocol, when she may potentially keep getting reinfected from her horses. Mm. Um, so I, there's, yeah, I think it's yeah. great for all of us to be um, a little bit knowledgeable about each other's field. So hopefully Emily um, continues to enjoy learning about human parasitology. Right. Dixon de Pommier. Kevin writes, 40-year-old Brazilian farmer with multiple heart problems visiting family in the U.S. Though the case report states that the patient does not have overt congestive heart failure, symptoms, congestive heart failure symptoms, his history of a dilated heart on echocardiogram and being a recipient of an automatic implanted cardioverter defibrillator strongly suggests that he has compensated uh, car- congestive heart failure. Basically, pump failure that is not causing symptoms. For the less clinically inclined, cardiac heart failure is a collection of symptoms due to a damaged heart's inability to supply enough blood to keep up with physiological demands. Typical symptoms of pump inadequacy are swelling of the legs, shortness of breath, Due to the wet lungs, pulmonary congestion, failure, fatigue, uh, fatigue rather, weakness, and fast heart rate. CHF has many causes, which, for our purposes, can be divided into infectious and non-infectious. Common causes for non-infectious cardio um, CHF 
I'll just say CHF, ischemia, familial, alcohol slash toxic, familial, postpartum, idiopathic, and many others. Infectious causes for CHF to consider viral, HIV, rubella, EBV, echovirus, poliovirus, Coxsackie, etc., protozoa, a toxoplasma, myocarditis, rare cases of malarial cardiomyopathy, or cardio myocarditis, cardiac involvement with <laughs> trypanosoma rhodesia infection. Uncommon metazoan parasitic invasion of the heart include Econococcus, trichinosis, Entamoeba histolytica, and cysticercosis. Note also that schistosomiasis can cause pulmonary hypertension and enlargement of the right side of the heart. Even the lowly strongyloides has played a bit role, see references. Satterwaite's 1913 cardiology text describes invasion of the heart by pentastoma denticulatum, as well as throwing in syphilis, TB, blasto, and actinomycetes. Most of the foregoings are bagatelles compared to our patient's diamond affliction. I just added the diamond myself. Our 40-year-old farmer is no doubt one of the WHO's 2016 estimated 8 million worldwide patients who are infected with trypanosoma cruzi is also one of the 20 to 30 percent of the chronically infected people who go on to develop Chagas cardiomyopathy. It usually takes decades of latent infection with T. cruzi before heart involvement is apparent. The scale of this disease is large and now internationally distributed due to immigration and travel. CCM is often overlooked, especially in non-endemic areas. The main manifestations are heart failure, arrhythmia, heart block, and thromboembolism, i.e. stroke, TIA, systemic, and pulmonary embolus. Right bundle branch block is characteristic. Grossly, the heart becomes dilated, fibrotic, and thinned with the involvement of apical aneurysms. Prognosis is guarded with annual mortality estimated at 4% and 5 and 10 year, all cause mortality of 35 and 60% respectively. Pathogenesis is debated but generally agreed to center on these processes direct parasite damage and immune mediated neurogenic and microvascular damage. Diagnosis is via immunologic assay using ELISA and other confirmatory immunologic tests such as the Wiener recombinant ELISA. Immunofluorescent assay, indirect hemagglutinin, Western blotting and PCR, differential clinical groups use a variety of diagnostic algorithms outlined below in reference. Treatment of CMM is a dilemma since cure rates decline with duration of infection and the benefits of therapy are unclear. Additionally, laboratory confirmation slash seroconversion can take years to occur. The drug of choice for Chagas disease in general is benzinidazole. A second-line drug is nifurtamox. Pharmacologic therapy in Chagas disease must be tailored to the stage of infection, acute, indeterminate, chronic, and the organ involved. Treatment in our patient first requires clinical st staging. At least five clinical staging systems are used to classify patients. Our patient meets the conclusion, the inclusion criteria for largest CCM therapy trial to date. The BENEFIT trial, a prospective randomized double-blind trial of benzinidazole published in 2015. Approximately 2,800 patients were followed for over five years. Though benzinidazole decreased PCR positivity, unfortunately, the clinical endpoints <clears throat> in treated versus non-treated patients were not significantly different. Antitrypanosomal treatment may likely have little benefit for our patient. What other treatments may be offered? Medical therapy can include enopril. And, and so I'll, I'll read these. <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Um, enalapril, that's an ACE inhibitor. Carbetalol, okay. that's a somewhat non-selected beta blocker. And spironolactone, that's a type of diuretic. All of which have shown some benefit. Uh, trials nicely summarized by Bocci et al. Thrombosis within apical aneurysm usually necessitates long-term anticoagulation. Traditionally with warfarin, unused for the status of newer anticoagulants for this in indication. Cardiac resynchronization therapy has been attempted, but reliable um, trial data is not available. Aminodarone has been used in arrhythmia, 
management, but there are some troubling data suggesting increased mortality. A curious coincidence. Some aminodiarone derivatives have antitrypanosomal activity. Our patient has an implanted defibrillator, though randomized trial data supporting an unequivocal mortality benefit are lacking. <clears throat> the disease, As disease progresses, LV assist devices and heart transplant become possibilities, though limited in low-resource countries. These case highlights the limits and relative crudity of current medical understanding of the pathogenesis and treatment of chronic Chagas cardiomyopathy. In addition to screening and public health prevention measures, advances in basic parasite host organ biology and understanding of the immunology of this disorder will be needed in order to improve treatment for this disease. Thanking the professors of parasites for their insights, and he lists extensive references. Yes, and these will be in the show notes, of course. Absolutely. Uh, we put them all, and, and Kevin always has a wonderful list of references, extensive, yes. for which we're very grateful. My hope is that some of these will appear in the seventh edition. <laughs> they they do, actually. A lot of them do. It's well, uh, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Daniel. Uh, I'm, I'm going through all the references. Is there someone? Oh, I'm going to get to another one. <laughs> so many references. It's great. Uh, Till writes, Dear Twip Professors, I have been listening to your podcast for some months now, and I've been wanting to submit a case guest for some time, so I'm happy to finally find the time to do so. I really appreciate the thoughtful and empathetic approach to patients, their class, social situation, and also gender you convey in your podcast. I work as a junior doctor MD in the university clinic in Hamburg, Germany, where I'm in training for internal medicine and infectious disease. We have the Bernhardt Nacht Institute for Tropical Diseases here in Hamburg, and I am fortunate enough to spend some time doing full-time research in the wonderful lab group of Professor Addo, an emerging disease specialist. After finishing my research stipend, I am currently back in the clinical practice and work in the outpatient department for tropical medicine, where we see mostly sick returning travelers and also do some pre-travel consultations and vaccinations. I actually found out about the podcast from a student who did part of his internship with us, in whom I am grateful for pointing me toward the wonderful hours of entertaining education that is TWIP. As for my case guest for TWIP 160, this one is, like Daniel Griffin said in the last show, pretty straightforward. The 40-year-old farmer from Brazil with dilated cardiomyopathy is most likely suffering from the cardiac manifestations of the Chagas disease or American trypanosomiasis, also called Chagas heart disease, or CHD. The anthropozoonosis is caused by the protozoan Trypanosoma cruzi and transmitted by the so-called kissing bug, a family of distinctively shaped insects that mostly feed on vertebrates' blood and apparently like to sting or bite near the mouth, hence the name. As I'm sure you'll explain later, the bug does not transmit the trypanosomes directly during the sting, but rather defecates next to the bite wound, where the feces containing the parasites can be easily rubbed into the wound or any mucous membranes like that of the eye, classic Romagna sign seen, um, only in about 5% or less of cases. Other modes of transmission include oral transmission, the infamous crushed sugarcane drinks on the beaches of Brazil, <laughs> vertical transmission, a congenital mother to child, and rarely blood transfusion or organ transplantation. The acute phase of the infection is characterized by unspecified symptoms like fever, chills, lymphadenopathy, tachycardia, and hepatosplenomegaly. Interesting, about half of the patients already show some ECG alterations at this stage. The acute stage is seldom diagnosed and symptoms usually resolve after two to four weeks. Only 20 to 23 percent of patients continue to the chronic stage, which may present years and decades after the acute phase. Cardiac and intestinal manifestations, mega esophagus, mega colon, can be distinguished, and it is interesting to observe that in some Latin American countries, only a certain form of these manifestations occur. In Colombia, CHD seems to be the most prevalent form, while in Brazil, both forms can be found. Maybe you could shed some light on the reasons for that. 
The damage caused by the infection is twofold, a direct damage by the trypanosomes as well as indirect damage from autoimmune reaction. However, as in so many infectious diseases, it seems to be unclear why certain patients develop severe disease while others never develop any symptoms. Mostly during the acute phase of the disease, the parasympathetic nervous system is damaged. In the heart, this leads to an overdominance of the sympathetic nervous system, ECG abnormalities like the right bundle branch block described, and subsequent dilated heart failure, often called dilated cardiomyopathy. Aneurysms in the tip of the heart and subsequent formation of intramural thrombus are also common. The prognosis of DCM in general is poor, with a 10-year survival rate of about 10%, although this depends on the severity of the disease. Now, <laughs> for the additional questions <laughs> uh, asked by Dr. Griffin. One, my differential for this would include other causes for DCM. One, hereditary, so we want to know about family history. Two, previous myocardial infarction, so we want to know about that patient's history. Uh, next, a long-lasting history of hypertension or tachycardia, um, toxic agents such as alcohol, chemotherapy, or other infectious agents such as viral causes. Um, and then endocrinological diseases like hyperthyroidism. Uh, how to confirm the diagnosis. In the acute phase, the trypanosomes can be observed in a blood smear. Since the parasites apparently have a similar density as leukocytes, it is also possible to do a density gradient centrifugation and find enriched parasites in the buffy coat between the plasma and the erythrocytes. In the chronic phases, serology can be performed as well as PCR. Only if historical interest and hopefully no clinical value is the method of xenodiagnosis by letting uninfected kissing bugs feed on the patient and examining the bug feces after one, two, and three months. How to treat the antiparasitic drugs of choice are benzonidazole or nifertamux. The CDC recommends it goes into some doses there. Apart from the antiparasitic treatment, supportive treatment of dilated cardiomyopathy, um, and then the only curative treatment is heart transplantation. The cardiac thrombus, probably treated with anticoagulation uh, to prevent thromboembolic disease, which could lead to strokes. And in handling the patient, I would try to convey the severity of the disease. As mentioned above, the mortality is higher than that of many forms of cancers. Stress the importance of regular cardiological follow-up and convey that this is not due to a personal error in behavior, as Chagas is still endemic in the poorer population in southern Brazil and was much more prevalent in the past. If I should win, I don't think I need a copy of The Red Mother, so maybe you could send it to someone else. <laughs> But I would love to receive a signed copy of PD6. Thank you all for this most entertaining and educative podcast. You really made me start on the path to becoming a parasite nerd, a path I will hope to progress upon for months and years to come. All the best, Till. Andrew writes, Hi, TWIP Trio. I've just come back from a week-long training for clinical parasitology at the CDC. Hopefully it was worth the trip and I get this correct differential. Trypanosomiasis, malaria, filariasis, schistosomiasis. Not very long because these are unique symptoms. To keep this shorter, I will dive in. Chagas disease, most likely acquired as a child. T. cruzi, endemic to South America. A lot of people think it infects its host when it bites, but right, as we heard from the previous email, defecates on the skin and uh, then you scratch it in. Acute symptoms, not common, but if they show they're mild, such as headache and swelling, resolve spontaneously. 60 to 70 percent of these patients do not develop clinically apparent disease, remain infected for life. Roughly 30 to 40 percent develop chronic cardiac, cardiac and or digestive form of Chagas. Cardiac form can cause cardiomegaly, heart failure, and altered heart rate. The digestive form can cause megacolon and constipation. Both forms can be deadly. Treatment benzonidazole must be attained through CDC, not available through U.S. pharmacies. Other treatments, heart surgery or transplant. Thank you for your great podcast i love tuning in wow <clears throat> eric writes hi there triperonies or triperonies depending on how you want to pronounce that i feel reasonably confident in my guess for this week's case the description that dr griffin gave was as close a description of shagas cardiomyopathy as i've ever heard the patient being a farmer from brazil would also be consistent with the di that diagnosis as shagas disease is quite an issue there I tried to think of other possible diagnoses, but short of a non-parasitic etiology, I can't think of any other parasitic infections prevalent in Brazil that causes cardiomyopathy. The best way to diagnose 
chronic Chagas disease is by looking for Tegu cruzite specific antibodies in the patient's serum. This is quite a sad diagnosis because Chagas cardiomyopathy, from what I've read, is quite deadly since it's a progressive disease. The exact cause of the pathology is not fully understood, but it's thought to be either immune-mediated or caused by the persistence of the parasite in heart tissue. For treatment, benzinidazole is frequently given, although there is no evidence that it proves any benefit in cases of Chagas cardiomyopathy. Treatment of the cardiac pathology, according to the European Society of Cardiology, is angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, and adrenergic beta blockers, to reduce mortality and diuretics and or di- digoxin. I'm sorry, digoxin, to reduce mortality. The, in cases of particularly bad cardiomyopathy, sometimes a heart transplant is the only option. This is quite an unfortunate diagnosis, and I hope I'm wrong and that your patient is doing well. Best regards, Eric. Daniel. I was, this, this is really true. We have a lot of emails this time. We um, do. David writes, Dear Parasitism Panelists, I fa- finally managed to write in again after logging for a very long time. My guess is that the Brazilian man with the heart problems has a chronic form of Chagas disease. This is my first intuition when I heard the case. I'm unlucky to forget the consequences of Chagas because when I started listening to TWIP some five years ago, I remembered an episode of a swollen eye after a bug bite some years earlier and in a prolonged state of anxiety, I eventually made it to the Red <laughs> Cross in the capital of Managua where my blood tested negative. Chagas obviously exists in Brazil, and the EKG with right bundle branch block of the heart seems to confirm the diagnosis. I consulted the PDF of parasitic diseases, and I believe it may be a match, while thrombosis and aneurysms also appear as a consequence of angiostrongulus costa... You want to pronounce that? Angiostrongulus costa ricensis. See, okay, just <laughs> let you jump in there. I think that this would well, look. We make a good team. <laughs> I think this would look very different with much more acute manifestations. And also, there would be fever and possibly encephalitis. So this seems unlikely, although I have no medical background to sustain this gut feeling. Confirmation with IgG would ensure the diagnosis is correct, I suspect. So I would go with Chagas. If this is the case, I would recommend psychological counseling. Although Shakespeare refers to death by exclaiming, "'Tis a cons- consummation devoutly to be wished." Being confronted with our mortality will never come easy, especially with a sly killer as Chagas, where it might take another decade or another hour. Maybe one might live long more to the fullest, but this is a meager silver lining. Writing from a rather chilly Hirotepe, where the rainy season is slowly coming to an end. I wish you best wishes, David. So, Daniel, if you if you you know had a bite like like David's and went and got diagnosed and you were positive, if you took drugs right away, would that prevent a chronic infection? I'm going to say we don't know. Um, that's one of the tough things. We we do usually recommend um, treatment for acute Chagas. Um, but as one of our um, emailers wrote in, there was sort of this concern with a recent benefit trial calling into question how how actually effective our mm. you know our our treatments. It's a tough one. Chris writes, "Hello, professors. Forty-seven F here in Stony Brook for this case study: Chagas disease." Okay, so we can skip a lot of this. I also had a question about dracunculus and its ability to utilize dogs. As a reservoir host, three of you discuss how the parasite can infect and survive in dogs and cats, but I question whether or not these animals can serve as an effective host. Although they can infect and survive in dogs, is it reliable enough to sustain a population of these parasites? First off, I wonder if dogs are a significant enough host to sustain this parasite, and if, if they are, how come it didn't come to our attention long ago, especially because this parasite has been known since biblical times? Second, even if dogs could serve as a significant host, we have effectively reduce the populations of this parasite to near extinction levels could it even rebound i know in many diseases that once it hits a certain threshold the disease is effectively extinct such as malaria in america where although we have the occasional person infected in new york city as well as the vectors one person or even tens of people is not enough for the sustained transmission could this be the case with dogs and cats as a reservoir where they can sustain but not effectively to save from extinction. Regardless, I found the paper interesting, and I'm glad you discussed it. I'm just curious about the disease ecology aspects. Uh, any thoughts on that, gentlemen? 
could the dogs and cats sustain it? Well, remember what we said, too, about we treated a whole bunch of people in a whole bunch of areas. And when you reduce that group to nothing, then what's left is these um, odd situations. And this might be one of those odd situations. It wouldn't have shown up if mm. everybody else was infected, but because no one else is, then this pops up. Okay. Also, if you remember, I wrote you all about a month ago about having Rich Osfield on for a tick episode. Well, mm. about three days after I sent that email, I attended a fascinating lecture from Dr. Maria Duke Wasser, a tick specialist at Columbia. Mm. And since she's at your university, I thought <laughs> I would let you know. And she has some very cool ideas about the dilution hypothesis. She would make a great guest. Do you know this uh, I don't. individual? I'm sorry, I don't. Look it up. Lastly, I thought I would ask if any of you will be attending the New York area meeting for parasitology December 3rd. There is no registration fee. There is both an oral and poster presentation, and it's super close. Hmm. I just found out about this the other day, but thought I would pass it on. Here's a link, which we'll put in the show notes. Hope to see you there, and hopefully I can get Dixon to sign my copy of <laughs> People, Parasites, and Plowshares. Be happy to do it. Are you aware of this meeting? I'm not. Hunter College, dude, it's right here. I'm like not, like I'm not aware, but I am now. I'm, <laughs> I'm hip. I'm hip. Okay. <laughs> you know, we could go, uh, Dixon, you we and could. I. We could. And, and maybe people would recognize you. I, well, they, they could. And Dixon, uh, can you take the next one? We only have a few left. Kevin C. writes, hello, Twipsters. I have been hesitant to email with my personal diagnosis for this podcast's case studies, but considering that my last diagnosis was correct, I think now is the time to start. Even though I may not have been as prolific with my diagnoses as the other Kevin that regularly emails with every episode, <laughs> I am confident with what is wrong with the patient from Brazil. Considering this man immigrated to the U.S. after having worked as a farmer in Brazil, the EKG results showing heart dilation with apical aneurysm is key in determining that this patient has been infected by none other than Trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease, or otherwise known as American trypanosomiasis. Since there are two phases of the infection, we've gone through most of that. I'm getting yeah, the hurry it. up. <laughs> this is not an award ceremony, and I'm not thanking my mother and father and all Speed these other the last leaders. paragraph. Thank you so much for these wonderful podcasts to help those of us trying to stay current uh, in the forever changing field of hard biological based science. I have been listening to all the Twixt podcasts at the behest of my boyfriend, and have been hooked. I've also been recommended all. I have also. I have also been recommending all of these fine podcasts to all of my co coworkers almost daily. We even heard from one of them in the last episode, John, the man that proclaimed to love parasites. We even have a friendly competition to see who will receive a signed copy of the textbook first. Keep up all the hard work and that these podcasts require, and then happy to see you um, have in store for us. I'm happy to see what you have in store for us next time. From a rainy day in Flagstaff, Arizona, with a temperature of 10 degrees C, Kevin. Daniel. Okay. Connor, Connor writes, um, and I, you know, as he says, I, uh, I got to catch up on the twips I missed on a 19 hour drive. So hopefully I'm in time for the <laughs> Chagas case. I yeah. think his case, he's guessing Chagas. He's hoping he's huh? running for both the PD six and the poem book. <laughs> and he says, he's very pleased to hear the cases with entomological ethology as he loved his medical entomology class with uh, Dr. Don Wesson. And he thanks us for education, advancement in the field, and society sensu lato. Hmm. Karen writes, chronic Chagas trypanosoma cruzi. If I were a doctor and for some reason I didn't know the patient was an immigrant, I'm not sure I would think to suspect this, but diagnosis can be made by serum IgG and, mm. you know, diagnosis and drugs, all the same that we've heard. Mm. Karen from Santa Barbara, California. And, Dixon, I don't think you can see the last one because I just pasted it in. Why don't you hit the refresh button on your browser? I'd be happy to do that if I can find it. Upper right. <laughs> in the upper right, it's not in. I have. I have it's a little this. circle. Well, while he I while he I, fumbles, I, I, should I just I, I, read ahead, or you? Why don't like you do it, Daniel? Okay. Go ahead, Daniel. Greetings, Twipster. She's hoping this she's bending. So she, bending, bending writes. Greeting, Twipsters. I hope I'm not too late to write in on the Brazilian man's case. It's rainy in Atlanta, 
uh, recently recommended TWIM by a colleague as a study aid for my upcoming ASCP microbiology certification exam. It's excellent. I then <laughs> discovered TWIP, which I think is even better. Oh, no, I added that. And uh, <laughs> now I have a hard time peeling myself away from it. Parasitism is a true hobby of mine and I've enjoyed every episode thus far. As for the most recent case, Trypanosoma cruzi. She doesn't have a copy of Parasitic Diseases, but I do have Google, my old parasitology textbook from undergrad, and a curious mind. Uh, and then she goes on, basically, to uh, talk about Trypanosoma cruzi, etc. All right. right. And she, right, there you and she go. gives us, per, her name is pronounced Benning. Well, there you go. All right. Uh, I, I put a number by the ones who haven't won books, as far as I can tell. Smart. The others I kept. Smart. All right, Daniel. Everyone pretty much got it, really. Uh, well, well if, they, if, they all if, guess the same thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. What do you, what do you two think? Vincent Dixon, do you feel like it was a ringer or do you feel like, boy, there could be something strange here? No, I, you know, I'm getting quite used to the fact that every now and then you want to ease up on the uh, cryptic. And uh, this is certainly not a cryptic uh, description. I mean, the right bundle branch block is going to just about do it. Once you said that, that's almost an, an algorithm for um, uh, Chagas disease. So I, I, I was very comfortable with my diagnosis of that. Mm, same thing. I just also said, where's the megacolon? Okay. <laughs> exactly. no, so it, it is, you know. And that's not a pronunciation device, by the way. That's a <laughs> phone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, and it is, you know, it, you know, these are, as I think I always tell the these are real cases. I don't make these up. So I'm always, uh, it's always right. nice, I should say, when you have a case that really seems to follow the classic descriptions. And, um, sure. you know, so here's a gentleman from an endemic area. He's got um, cardiac problems uh there's the apical aneurysm there's the early you know the right bundle branch block which is one of the early um uh ekg findings and uh we went ahead and actually in this case um i thought this was interesting because we did a chagas elisa that was positive we did a chagas if test that was positive and then we even did a chagas pcr that was positive so really confirmed um in this gentleman that this was um chagas disease and um, so, okay, so we say it's Chagas disease, and then um, let's talk, I guess I'm going to get back at the end, I'm going to go to like, what what do we do about this? But let's talk a little bit maybe about uh, Dixie White Gentleman, how did this man get this? Uh, oh, that's been covered, Daniel. So I everybody think knows. We've had a, a textbook <laughs> description of this in these letters that we've gotten. I think that everybody's aware now that the bug doesn't bite you and inject it. The bug bites you and sucks blood and makes room for that blood by defecating out the last blood meal, which contains the infectious stage of this organism. Which you And by the way, the bug actually secretes something into the bite wound, which induces itching. So that you'll be tempted right after that bug vacates the area to start to scratch. And when you do that, and if it, the bugs bite you around the eyes, of course, and you're going to rub the parasite into the uh, mucous membrane, and from there, the game starts. So I think that the life cycle is very straightforward. Uh, in the bug, it's not so straightforward. It, it involves a series of lectins and uh, um, proteins that uh, interact with each other uh, to allow this parasite to migrate down from the mouth area of the gut tract all the way to the anus. They can't go backwards. They go uh, Well, they do go backwards. They can't go forwards. And, and each stage of this infection takes place at a different spot along the gut tract of the reduvid. A reduvity, excuse me. And uh, <laughs> and that, that's basically the life cycle. It took a long time to discover it, but actually, um, yeah, I, I would almost, Carlos, yeah. Carlos Chagas did most of the legwork on this one. He, I think I read his uh, uh, history earlier on in the heroes section, and he was credited not only with discovering the disease, the entity, but also the vector and also the clinical manifestations. He did almost all of that stuff all by himself. And he was a rural doctor, by the way. He was not in any uh, city. So there, he had the advantage of seeing all this firsthand. Yeah, impressive. So, yes, and actually with all our emailers, it's um, like there, there's not much left untouched. <laughs> so no, they'll no. just sort of – Can you think of anything? They'll just reiterate what people have said sure, is sure. that, yes, as Dixon mentioned, this isn't um, – you're not – like a mosquito being stung. This is really the defecation gets rubbed either into the wound or into the mucous membrane or uh, the sweet drink, um, which has become a big uh, 
source of some little acute outbreaks, I guess, 60, 80, uh, maybe bigger outbreaks, you could say, in Brazil with some of the sugarcane crushed guys. Um, exactly. As far as um, the two different, I guess we'll say the three different manifestations, there's an acute there's sort of this, we're not sure if they were going to develop diseases, and then there's the chronic where they actually develop a manifestation. Um, the acute, as was mentioned, we usually recommend treatment. And if you look for a cure based upon PCR, um, we, we think about 80% of the time that acute treatment can affect that. So we do recommend it, um, but I am, I'm just, you know, to be honest and humble about this, I'm not sure that we've really followed people that were treated acutely long enough to know that that, that 80% cure is truly 80% cure. Because as we said, only about 20% go on to get chronic disease anyway. So you have 80% cure with your hands in your pockets, right? right. So I'm not sure when I do the math that I'm sure. Um, then the other were the two major manifestations down the road, the es esophageal or gastrointestinal, um, so esophageal or megacolon manifestations versus the cardiac. And we see regional differences. So you're down in South America, and that's where we're mainly seeing our cardiac manifestations, while in um, Central America, we see a lot more of our gastrointestinal manifestations. And mm -hmm. we don't know. We don't know if there's a different in difference in maybe the um, the host, maybe the ethnic groups have a different um, genetics that affects the, the susceptibility of different manifestations, or if it's an issue of being a slight variation in the parasite, um, whether it's right. different parasite in each different region. So, but we tend to see, um, at least I'll say, we, we tend to believe – uh, that the gastrointestinal manifestations, that the damage occurred right up front early on in the acute disease. And then later we're seeing an evolution where there's a little bit of maybe discussion. Um, we're not sure whether the cardiac manifestations are a progression um, that are directly related to the pathogen or whether it is some sort of progression that is set in place early on, maybe because of all the toxicity of the sympathetic dysregulation, et cetera. So that raises what was really a disappointing um, result of the benefit trial that one of our emailers wrote in about, which is where they actually went ahead and they treated a few thousand people. And um, yeah, the PCR became negative, but as far as clinical outcomes, you really didn't see what we were after. Wouldn't you say that that's a result that might reflect the fact that the bloodstream form, which transmits itself from tissue to tissue, is killed off by this drug, but the tissue parasites are still persisting, so you still get the pathology? Why would that be surprising? Yeah, I I mean, I, I, the tough thing is I don't think we really understand the mechanism of the pathology. Um, so what you know, so even though the recommendations still are that we offer treatment either with um, benzonidazole, that's supposedly first line, nifertamox is the alternative. Um, a lot of the other treatments, um, as far as treating the arrhythmias, so the antiarrhythmic agents, or as far as treating heart failure itself, those clearly are essential. Um, and I think some of our emailers wrote in about that. So we basically, even though we think of ourselves as parasitologists, when we're treating these people, we're either becoming, crossing the, the, the line into the world of cardiology or working closely with a cardiologist colleague, getting them on these drugs we call ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, the diuretics, um, implantable devices, et cetera. Yeah. I wanted to also mention the fact that if you're going to do a cardiac transplant in a patient that has acute Chagas disease and uh, they're better afterwards, the parasites are in the other tissues and they can still spread and reinfect or infect this new heart. And that patient can go on to develop a, a, a new disease uh, even though they were cured, in quotes, of their cardiac involvement. The, the, the new heart can become invaded and you can get the disease all over again. But it'll take a long time, of course, but still it could happen. Mm. So after a transplant, would you treat them with drugs again? It's a good question. I mean, if, if benzinidazole actually clears the parasite out of the blood, preventing a positive PCR, which is what I'm suggesting, but I don't know that for sure, then maybe it, could you keep them permanently on benzinidazole? And the answer is no. It's a very toxic drug, and mm. it just it won't work. So the answer is, is there's no good follow-up treatment for this parasite once it gains hold. 
But Daniel, what did you do with this patient? What was the outcome? Yeah. Um, so uh, this patient actually ended up getting treated with nifertamox, interesting enough. Um, and then we worked with a cardiologist. The patient was treated with uh, ACE inhibitor, diuretics, um, Coumadin. Um, because of the clot. And the reason he ended up with nifertamox, anyone can guess, maybe our emails can think about it, is this issue that we run into is the benzinizole is actually not well tolerated. So we initiated treatment, the patient didn't tolerate it, and then we ended up switching to the nifertamox, um, right. which they did complete. Um, so, But it's, it's a long, it's well, a long, it's two months of therapy. What do you mean not tolerated? Um, there's a lot of side effects. Um, basically, they, they feel poorly and they basically say, I'm not taking that anymore. Uh, mm. Because yeah. as I think one of our emails pointed out, they, don't, they come in they say, you know, I was told I have these issues, but I, I feel fine, relatively so. Um, mm. Maybe not quite as vigorous or able to perform the athletic, but they, you know, figure, well, that's just what's happening. But then you give them this medicine. Now they feel horrible. They say, you know, I came here. I didn't feel horrible, but now I do. Mm. Got it. <laughs> right. So. All right. Yuck. All right, let's give away a book. We uh, had 14 guesses, not including the people who have already won books. So we had more than 14. That's great. So let's pick a random number between 1 and 14. Drum roll. It's number 3. That goes all the way to the top. Who is number 3? Number 3 is... Ooh, 5, 4, 3 is... And no, that's not right. Where is number three? Sorry, everyone. We've well, got everybody on the edge of their chairs here. <laughs> the three is Carrie. Carrie. I think I right. might have read that one. Uh, well, yeah, well, that doesn't really matter, Dixon. <laughs> well, I would have remembered. <laughs> so, Carrie, um, you had, you won. Um, Congratulations. Uh, you said, please donate to a worthy cause or an unworthy one. If you prefer. So you don't want the textbook, but I'll send you a copy of the poetry book. Caitlin nice. would like a copy of the poetry book. So send us your, or send me your address to twip at microbe.tv. And since you are in Canada and need your phone for international shipping. Right. So now we have a textbook. Should we pick another winner? Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I think we should. So let's do another generate random number. <laughs> now number four. <laughs> number four is Chris. That's not so random. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's life. Chris uh, from Athens, Georgia. Right. Um, you've won. I don't remember if you've won or not, but if you haven't, send me your address, twip at microbe.tv. Right. And if anyone else would like Red Mother, which is a book of poetry about a parasite <laughs> living in yes. a host. Yes. Uh, it is Red Mother by Laurel Redziski. Send me an email to it at microbe.tv with the subject line Red Mother. And we'll send you, I only have, uh, so I have two more left. So two people, the first two people will get it. And as well, Caitlin. Whew, that was complicated. <laughs> Okay. It's okay. Parasites are complicated. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's have a quick look at this paper. A quick look. Like, like fifteen minutes. No, I think that I think it's going to need to be fifteen, so we still have time to do a new case. Yeah, it's got to be fifteen. Yeah. Um, so this is a paper Daniel picked, and it is a letter to Nature. It's called Genome Organization and DNA Accessibility Control Antigenic Variation in Trypanosomes. And this uh, this is coming from a lot of places. Um, a lot of places. Ludwig Maximilians University in München, Munich, Germany. Right. Um, the Sanger, Sanger University of Würzburg, University of Würzburg, Glasgow, Technion, Kex, Technion Glasgow. Israel, right. Glasgow yep. University of Glasgow. That's right. Um, yes, actually, it's the College of Medical Veterinary. Yeah, University of Glasgow. Mount Sinai here in New York City. It's the Icon Center, that's right. And Heidelberg University. The authors contributed equally, one, one in 15. Who is 15? Ah, the first and the second authors contributed equally. That's Laura Muller and Raul Cosentino. And the last author is T. Nikolai Siegel. Trypanosomes, hallmark antigenic variation. T. Brucei have variant surface glycoprotein. They do, yeah. And they have 2,500 genes encoding them. Exactly. And they switch 
Because as soon as you make antibodies, they switch, right? And another one pops up and they're not neutralized. Not all of them switch. Not all of them switch? No. Which ones switch? 99% don't switch. Which ones do switch? The ones that aren't killed by the immune system. Oh, yeah. But that one then will grow out, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> sure. And so uh, this is interesting because most of them are in long subtelomeric arrays, arrays, which means near the telomere. 65 of them are on mini chromosome. And about 15 of them are in expression sites where they one of them will be produced. Correct. And they go in sequence, don't they? I don't know. Yeah, they do. I don't know. They go in sequence, those 15? Actually, no, I'll, no. I'll jump in on that. 2,600 <laughs> let, let genes. Dan, let Daniel two. finish. So, let Daniel well, finish. Why don't, well, let, me, I'll do, let him start, I'll actually. Just, <laughs> want to start over? I'll no, cut all this no, out. No, no, this is all good. What, what we jump in and do, I'll do like the executive summary, and then we'll kind of get to some of the meat of it. Um, because what Dixon brought up is kind of the classic teaching was, you know, almost there was like one through two, 2,500, and you started with VSV. G1, and then you went to two and three, kind of marched down. Um, but this is really like sort of, I'll say, modern looking at that. So so they start off with their big picture comment, which is that organisms have evolved to evade the immune system. And one of these approaches is antigenic variation. And to do that, you need to have um, – a bunch of different antigens that you'll express. And you, you can do that two ways. One is you can have a huge collection of potential different antigens, which they show here, over 2,000 different um, VSGs that can be expressed. We, we can't keep something ready to hit every single antigen. So we've got the ability to recombine what we've got. That's our antibodies, et cetera. Um, and then they say, well, let's ha let's try to understand how they're doing this. And it, it's, you started to mention, Vincent, they first figure out the localization, where are these genes? And then they, they use some pretty cool science, which is this whole um, three-dimensional analysis. So this topographically associated domain analysis, where what they're saying is instead of the old school, where you really just looked at the specific gene in a promoter site, they started saying, well, you know what? Sometimes distant parts of DNA will come together and interact. Mm -hmm. And and that's actually so they're showing here how the VSGs through three dimensional um, organization are being modulated. And ultimately, what they're going to show us is that other parts of DNA that are distant on the linear tract are going to come together. There's going to be an association with two critical histones, and that's going to basically regulate the accessibility and the expression of the different VSG genes. The cool part here is the three dimensional genome analysis, which is called chromosome conformation capture. Yes. Where you can look at histones mediating these three-dimensional um, interactions at one nucleotide resolution because you're, you're combining it with sequencing. You basically immunoprecipitate with antibody. You cross-link the DNA. You immunoprecipitate with antibodies to chromatin. You digest it. You ligate it. And then you, you uncross-link and you sequence. So you can map all these three-dimensional interactions mediated by histones. It's amazing. Because, of course, they're coding DNA. So they do that with these trypan— And, in fact, they start by sequencing the entire genome of a strain that they want to do. They get 100-fold genome coverage. They assemble the complete genome. They do RNA sequencing to map the transcripts. They do this high C. And then they look at the effects, as Daniel said, of removing specific histones on VSG— expression as measured by RNA-seq. And what do they find, Daniel? These two specific um, histone variants, we'll say H3.V mm -hmm. and H4.V, are critical for basically the DNA accessibility and the expression of the, the different VSGs. So they went ahead, and when you delete both of them, you can actually shift the VSG expression. Right. And so pretty impressive. And... They also use another technique, single-cell sequencing. They can sequence individual trypanosomes to see what's going on in each one when they do these histone variations. So this is, this is ap applying the most contemporary, high-tech genome analysis methods to trypanosomes. They say this is the first time this has been applied to this issue. An pretty, organism to any organism. Well, it's been done in any. It's been, well, I mean, there's there are not a lot that switch antigenically like this, right? But, no, but there are some. For, for this particular one, 
uh, it's, well, it's the first in trypanosomes. I don't know if it's been done in other parasites, but it's been done in uh, eukarya, other eukaryotes for sure. So it's called a de novo haplotype specific assembly and scaffolding of these arrays that encode these uh, variant surface glycoproteins. So what's the bottom line? They identify these histones as a link between the global architecture of the genome, local chromatin conformation, and antigenic variation. So they're really important in, in the ability to switch, which we didn't know. As, as Daniel said, we just figured they were done sequentially. Right? But we're still left with wondering how sequentially in a living organism these, organi- these trypanosomes generate all these variants sequentially. I mean, how they express them? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. I guess, yeah. What I was left with is what is what's the trigger? So as we as we know from other animal models, if you do trypanosome infections in B cell um, depleted animals, you don't get the um, sequential change. So the the question is, what is it about the antibodies? Right, as we've had discussion there on the outside of cells, what are they somehow doing? How are they triggering the trypanosomes to um, modulate at the three-dimensional level, the expression of these different genes. And I'm, we're still, but we're, boy, this was a giant jump forward in understanding. Yeah. So they here's a part of the answer, Dixon. If they deleted both of these histone variants, it increased DNA accessibility across sites that are otherwise transcriptionally repressed, VSG sites, right? These th- This enhanced the rate of recombination-based switching. So when they remove rate. this system. The so the, the idea is that to get a, a, a VSG expressed, you have to put it into the expression site. You have to move it in from a subtelomeric region, right? right. And so that is based on chromatin structure. And, and they could show that. You could, you could get recombination if you mess with the histones. So it must be some histone modification that is triggered that leads to this. But what causes that we don't know no that's what i was saying and that's what you'd like to know but as daniel said we're getting closer we would love to know this and i think you should do the rest you should do the rest <laughs> of the experiment right. i was thinking about it <laughs> but uh, the technology is just remarkable that you can map three-dimensional uh, genome structures on, on a single nucleotide level and they do that and they have lovely pictures of these assemblies and right. you can see that the g the vsgs are clustered there are, there are, right. In fact, the whole chromosome is clustered exactly. when you look at what's functional there. It's very interesting. Yeah. And this is, you know, yeah. technologically, as um, some of our listeners may know, it, it becomes more challenging to analyze DNA as you get close to the, the telomeres. And so, you know, sort of mm-hmm. opening up as our technology gets better, our understanding of a lot of things that previously were much harder to, uh, to study. Dixon, do you have a... Parasite hero for I us. I do, I do, and I, I will, I will <laughs> put a caveat on this. These heroes all lived some time ago. These were not recent heroes. These were heroes of the past, and so maybe that's the reason why we're falling short on women's um, inclusion. Well, some of these women died in the past, Dixon. And I know, but in the recent past, not in the f- the distant past, like this gentleman, for instance, uh, Arthur Loos. Uh, he has a PhD. He's obviously German. Um, his years were 1861 to 1923. And he, working in Egypt, well, I'll just read his um, little blurb below his picture on the book. Lowe's completed the description of the life cycle of Ancelostoma duodenal by accidentally spilling a sample of hookworm larvae on his hand while trying to administer them to guinea pigs. He experienced itching at the site of the spill later that day. Later that month, Lose discovered eggs of A. duodenal in his own stool, proving that the L3 larvae in the infectious sta- is the infectious stage for humans, and that it penetrates unbroken skin to initiate the infection. This seminal finding was to become the basis for controlling hookworm infection throughout the world at the community-slash-public health level. A clear example of luck favoring the prepared mind. And, you know... <laughs> 
These were simple experiments that they were conducting in these days because they didn't have a clue as to anything that was going on. And I must say that the epicenter for German, for, or for rather for parasitology, for its birth, so to speak, as a science, was Germany. So they produced lots of scientists that emigrated from that country to various places throughout the world, mostly into Africa and into South America and into Asia as well, to look for parasites. They were just out there looking for parasites. And uh, that was their main contribution. They weren't sophisticated scientists in some cases. Uh, they were just looking for an explanation as to how these things managed to go from host to host. And those were the basic science uh, questions of their day. And then once we knew that, of course, uh, they suggested control programs for many of them. And uh, we took advantage of that. And uh, we're still doing that today. We're still discovering new parasites and new life cycles and ways of dealing with them. So that's my uh, choice of – we're going alphabetically through the book, by the way, so there's no particular order to the parasite subject. How many subject. more do you have left? Well, we've got a half a book left. Well, do you have a woman next time, please? Let's do, let's do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll look through some of our emailers. No, we'll do Miriam Rothschild. We, let's do Miriam we, Rothschild. We did we Miriam did, Rothschild. We, we can't keep doing it. Let's do, do her again. <laughs> no, we're not going to do We're going to do – we're going to do, well, we do the one that was Eloise Cram next time. We will time. do Eloise. Okay? We will do Eloise. In fact, you should alternate men and women for the next 10 years. Is that an order? Yes. <laughs> I, I concur. You know I can't order you, Dixon. You, you're, you're just too respected. <clears throat> no, that's not it at all. <laughs> Daniel, let's have a new case. Excellent. Right. Excellent. Um, so uh, I don't know if this one will be hard or easy. I'm going to suspect that this is a challenging case. Um, so everyone get yourselves ready. And this was a case that I, I got involved with and I was asked to um, asked to be involved because it was a patient, a 30 year old woman who was originally from Bolivia, um, but she was back and forth and she actually had to travel back to Bolivia during her third trimester for some family issues. Um, and I get involved because she, she delivers her child um, in the U.S., um, but when the child is born, they're noted on ultrasound to have a pericardial effusion. So it's fluid around the heart. So it's, again, it's a, another uh, individual from South America with a heart issue. Ascites, so there's actually fluid in the abdomen, a moderate PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. So people can look that up. Um, the actual function of the heart is okay. Um, it's a little more information. I mean, this this woman herself, uh, the baby has no past medical history. The woman herself says that she was healthy with no um, issues during the pregnancy. Uh, then we notice this trip back and forth with Bolivia. No surgery. There's no allergies for either of them. Um, but then we have a little bit of information on the, the baby is that the white count is elevated 17.4. Um, 37 neutrophils, a fair amount of limps, 44 limps, four monos, two eos, one basophil, and they are going to go ahead and do a diagnostic evaluation. So not giving you guys a lot, but I am saying here's a baby born to a mother who went on a trip down to Bolivia while pregnant, delivers the baby, and now the baby has some cardiac issues as well as a bit of fluid around the heart and in the abdomen. And so what – and I will tell you, it is a parasite, if that is helpful. Tell us again how long she was in Bolivia. Um, she was actually there for much of the um, third trimester, but then she returned back um, before she delivered. And it is a little interesting, right? Here's a woman flying during third trimester. So sort of a yeah. small woman, and, and she flew during her third trimester. And I was saying that a lot of airlines will not let you fly during your third uh -huh. trimester, but she somehow got away with it. Maybe she didn't look pregnant. <laughs> can can happen, right? No, it definitely can. A lot of a lot of women are not obviously, and they're also yeah. not obviously. You know what stage of the pregnancy you're in. So yeah, sure. All right, that's TWIP one six one. Wow, where can you find TWIP, Dixon? You have any idea how the Microbe TV, Microbe TV slash TWIP? Yeah. Now, if you have a phone or a tablet and you like to listen on, oh, it, I want to mention something. What do you before? do? Okay, you're uh -huh. cutting off. No, I wanted to add something to it because uh, I was just down at the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene mm -hmm. meeting in uh, mm -hmm. New Orleans, yes. New Orleans. And while I was there, I encountered somebody from the Centers for Disease Control who remembered me from the old days when I used to work in the lab. And we had a nice exchange of conversation. And then I said, hey, I've got an idea. So I went to my cell phone. I said, do you have a cell phone? He says, yeah. I said, get it out. I said, okay, let's go to Google. 
So we went to Google. I said, type out Parasites Without Borders and see what you get. So he did. So I said, ah, now look at the menu. And the menu, you know, I said, find Parasitic Diseases, 6th edition. He says, hey, look at this. I said, click it. I said, when you get back to the CDC, give it to everybody. And he says, I'm going to do that. Of course, you don't tell him to give TWIP to everybody. (laughs) I didn't say that. Cool. I didn't say that. Very good. We know where your allegiance is. To. Exactly. Remember, there was TWIP before Parasites Without that, Borders. That was absolutely correct. And there was yeah. parasitic diseases before there was TWIP. Before there were humans. Before there were humans. That's right. You can find TWIP at microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you listen on a phone or a tablet, you use an app. Please just subscribe so that we get subscription numbers and you get every episode. Yeah. As they are released, which is uh, usually twice a month. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways you can do that. And, of course, you send your guesses and your questions and comments to TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. A pleasure as always. My pleasure as always. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes, but we're going to have trouble in just a minute. <laughs> okay. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org, the newly revised website, and the livingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. We thank Ronald Jenkins for the music and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.